on the first day of the year, right? It's a fresh start. It's a new beginning, as we just saw. For some, that's not that big a deal because 2016, you know, is a pretty good year. Um, you know, and, and you're just looking forward to just another good year. For others, man, a new beginning is just uh, long awaited. Um, I think for a lot of people, it seems like this year. It seems like 2016, a lot of people are happy to see behind us, right? Probably nobody more than Mariah Carey. <laughs> <laughs> You were the ones who stayed up <laughs> and watched that debacle. <laughs> oh, poor Mariah. For some people, you know, it, it was a difficult year and you're glad to see it gone. But either way, we look in anticipation and in hope for 2017, don't we? I mean, either way, we're just, we're, we're, it, it's a new time. And, and maybe some of you, you know, as even Scott talked about, you've made some, some new goals for the year or commitments or we like um, resolutions. And as a, as a, as a Christian, I, I believe it's always a good idea. Um, and this is why I, I like to talk about this a lot on the first Sunday of the year. I think it's important for us to ask this question. What does God want? What does God want? want now there's a lot of answers to that question and, and then and then you throw in maybe some of the specific things that he wants um, in your specific situation in your specific life um, and you could come up with a lot of good answers to that question what does God want but I, I think there's something that we see all throughout scripture that God wants from all of us and it's this God wants all the first things in life he wants the first things in our life. First things are special to us, right? We hold on to those first things. In my office, I have hanging our very first bulletin from our first Sunday ever as a church. On our Christmas trees, a lot of times we have ornaments that say our first year together, right? Or baby's first Christmas, and we keep, a lot of times, we'll keep some of those first things because first things are important to us. First things are important to God as well. And, and God wants the first things in your life. He wants those first things. The Bible calls this first fruits. I don't know if you've heard that word before, but we find that in Scripture. And first fruits is a principle that God has established in his word and it, 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 it's a way for him to bless his people, this idea of first fruits. Today, we don't often understand this, 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 this principle, uh, and I think because we fail to understand this principle, we miss out on a lot of God, the full extent of God's blessing in our lives. I, I really believe that. We, we don't understand this idea of first fruits, and so therefore, we miss out on sometimes the full extent of God's blessing in our lives and the things that he's promised First fruits are the first and best portion that's set aside, given to the Lord as a sign that the remaining harvest yet to come is holy and blessed of the Lord. You see, back in that day when, when there, there would be, you know, they'd have their harvest and God would say, I, when that harvest comes in, I want you to take the first fruits of that harvest, the first part of that harvest, and I want you to just give that to me. Now think about that. They've been waiting all year, and this is going to be what's going to carry them on for the year, sustain them, provide for them was this harvest. And God's saying, I want that first part and give it to me. Now that's an incredible step of faith by saying, okay, God, we give this to you, and in faith we trust then that you're going to bless the rest of our harvest, that the rest of it is going to be so fruitful that, 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 that the rest of it is going to provide for us. It's a way of saying, God, we know that it's not just the, the toil of our hands that's going to provide for us, but that provision is going to come from you. And because we know that, we're willing to give you the very first of our fruits, the first of our harvest. Man, it is a sacrificial faith offering of the first and best things in our life to the Lord. What does God want? God wants all the first things in our life. We see this principle laid out in Scripture, and I'm going to just kind of lay it out for you this morning. We see it some, in some direct instructions from Scripture. The first thing that he wants, we see, is that he wants, he, we see it in Scripture, we see that he wants the first, our firstborn. He wants our firstborn. In Numbers chapter 3, verses 11 through 13, it says this. 
And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Behold, I have taken the Levites from among the people of Israel. Instead of every firstborn who opens the womb among the people of Israel, the Levites shall be mine, for all the firstborn are mine. On that day I struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. I consecrated for my own all the firstborn in Israel, both of man and of beast. They shall be mine. I am the Lord. He goes on also um, in, in Exodus twenty two twenty nine 29 to talk about not just the firstborn, but he says also the firstborn son. He said, I want that to be dedicated to me. Your firstborn belongs to me. He goes further in Exodus 22:30 and he says he says you shall not delay to offer from the fullness of your harvest and from the outflow of your presses the firstborn of your sons shall be given to me you shall do the same with your oxen and with your sheep seven days it will be with its mother and on the eighth day you shall give it to me so he's saying not only your firstborn but I want the firstborn of your oxen your sheep you know your herds I want the firstborn Next, we see in Scripture that God says, I want the first of your harvest, like I just talked about. Leviticus 27.30 talks about that. And, and it says this, it says, Every tithe of the land, whether the seed of the land or the fruit of the trees, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. He's saying, I want the first part of your harvest. And, and, and in 2 Chronicles 31, I'm going to throw some of these, I'm going to throw a lot of Scripture at you. So some of them we're going to read, others I'm just going to tell you. You can write it down and look it up if you want later. But 2 Chronicles 31.5 says, in addition to the fields, what the fields produce, he says, I want the first of your wine, your oil, and your honey. That belongs to me. Look at Proverbs, uh, look at Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth. And with the first fruits of all your produce, then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. He's saying, hey, whatever it is that's your wealth, whether, whether it's um, your, the, the, the fields that you, uh, where it produces or your cattle or for us, you go to your jobs, whatever it is, I want you to honor me with the first part of it. The first of your wealth belongs to me. Another place in Scripture we see this first being laid out is in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. He's talking to a church there, um, and, he, and he, says, he says this. He, he says, I want your first love. He says, but I have this against you. He's talking to this church. He lays out all these great things this, this church done, and you know, you, you're doing this, and you're doing this good, and you're doing this well, and I'm pleased with this, but this I have against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first, or in, in, in every other translation, it says, you've abandoned your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I'll come and remove your lampstand. He's saying, hey, I, you've forgotten your first love. And I want your first love. I want to be first place in your heart. And so he says, I, I, I want your firstborn. I want the first of your harvest. I want, I want uh, the, the, your first love. I want the first part of your heart. So God's establishing this idea that he wants the first things in our life. But here's something else that's noteworthy. In James chapter 1, James chapter 1, um, verse 18, he says this, Of his own will, he, being God, brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So, He's saying here that us as believers, we have become first fruits for God. We're like a first fruits. We're the first of a new creation, a world that's set free from the bondage and the decay of sin and brought into the family of God as sons and daughters. And he's saying, you'll be the first fruits. So we as believers, we're, we're set aside as belonging to God. It's where we get the word sanctified or we get the word holy you've heard these words but those mean is we're, that we are set aside for God we're his first fruits and we're we're set aside as belonging to God so what this boils down to is the fact that our whole lives belong to God because we are first fruits our whole lives are his and, and so, so now I want to just lay out some, some other areas in Scripture where maybe it's not direct, but it's implied that he wants these first things in our life. The way that this, our, our, putting our whole lives in his hands and being his fruits, I want to share with you some ways that the Scriptures kind of show that that will play out in our lives. Okay? 
These are some things that are implied in Scripture. And it's implied in Ecclesiastes 12.1 that he wants the first part of our life. God wants the first part of life. Ecclesiastes 12.1 says, Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you say, I have no pleasure in them. In other words, before you get all old and cynical, I want your heart to be focused on me. Before the day is coming, you're just like, I'm just sick of all this going on. When you're young and you're idealistic and you, and you got your whole life ahead of you, I want you to be focused on me. I want your heart to turn towards me. Okay? So he's saying, hey, I, I, want, you, I want you at a young age to have your life and your heart committed to me. He wants the first part of life. There's a reason why that's important, and, and you know that a study was done by the Barna Research Group that says 80% of those who do not become Christians by the age of 18 never do. 80% of those who don't become Christians before the age of 18 never do, which means something that, you know what, we're more open to following after God and to commit our lives to God when we're younger. The older we get, the more difficult it gets. What else is he uh, talks about and implies in Scripture is that he wants the first part of our day. He wants the first part of our day. In Genesis 22, 3, it says that Abraham got up very early to do what God had told him to do. And you know what? He saw the hand of God spare his son Isaac. In Job 1, 5, it says Job would offer sacrifice to God early in the morning. And he was noted by God to be holy, and he was ultimately blessed by God immensely. 1 Samuel, in 1 Samuel 1, 19 and 20, it says that Hannah worshipped early in the morning, and God opened her womb, and she gave birth to Samuel, who went on to be a great prophet of God. In Psalm 5, 3, it says that David seeks the Lord in the morning, and he was known to be a man after God's own heart. In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, it says that Jesus himself would often get up early in the morning. So it says get up early in the morning, usually when it was still dark, and he would go spend time with his heavenly Father. God wants the first part of our day. Next we see that he wants the first day of the week. Um, you know, I don't know if you guys know, like... We meet on Sundays, um, and, and, and that, that, that goes back historically for, I believe, some significant reasons. Um, one reason I, I believe the church meets on Sundays is because Jesus rose from the grave on Sunday. And I believe that, that they, they be, the early church began to gather on the first day of the week to celebrate together the fact that Jesus had risen from the grave on the first day of the week. We see that, um, you know, throughout Scripture. In fact, John chapter 20, verse 1 is an example of just, um, you know, now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been rolled away from the tomb. I... <laughs> First, let me just say, for those of you who don't know, Sunday's not the end of the weekend. <laughs> it's actually the beginning of the week, first day of the week. And Jesus rose from the grave on the first day of the week. We also meet that way because the early church met on the first day of the week. And we see that throughout Scripture in Acts chapter 20, verse 7. said that they gathered on the first day of the week. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, Paul gives instruction. He says, when you get together on the first day of the week, bring your offerings together at that time. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, it's the, it's the place where we see um, it referred to as the Lord's Day. Now, I know um, there, there's different interpretations of what that term means, on, on, but, but John says, I, I, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And we really since then have begun to refer to this day we get together as the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. Now, this isn't, I'm not here to say that if you go to a Saturday night service, you're somehow displeasing God. But what I am saying is, what better way to start off your week saying, I'm going to give God the first things in my life this week than to say, you know what? In the morning, on the first day of the week, I'm going to gather with the people of God and I'm going to worship the Lord. I think it's an incredible way to start your week. I think it's a way that honors God and that he's pleased with. And I think he wants the first day of our week. 
Now, why is it so important to give God these first things in our life? Why are those things important? Why is it important for us to, to, to realize these things and to go, oh, you know what? I better, I, I need to check on my, I need to see if I'm giving God these first things. I'll tell you why it's so important for us to give God the things that he wants. Is because there's another principle in scripture that we see all throughout scripture that's at work as well. And turn to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. And in verse 12, he's talking about Satan. He's talking about Lucifer here. When he says this, How you have fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. I don't know if you noticed right there, but, but five times he's, you know, he's, Satan is saying, I will, I will, I will. And what he's trying to do is he's saying, I'm going to set myself up above God. I'm going to go after what God wants. I'm going to go after the things of God, and I'm going to claim those for myself. And you know what? That's what he does in our lives. What Satan wants, what God wants. We see that principle in Scripture. We see that principle in our lives and in our culture everywhere, don't we? What does God want? God wants the first things in our life. So you know what? Satan's going to do everything he can to make sure God doesn't get those first things in our life. He's going to try to keep those things from, 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 from God. He's going to keep us from giving God our firsts. Think about it. Let's go back through our list. Your firstborn. Man, I, let me just say this. If you have children, I mean, obviously you need to pray for all of your children all the time. <laughs> I mean, prayer is, is hugely important as a parent. I, I would encourage you, you know, if you, if you doubt that or, or you don't know how to do that, there's a good book out there called The Power of a Praying Parent. Man, grab that book. But as a parent, you need to be praying. I would just say you need to give a double portion of prayer to your firstborn. And, and the reason why I say that, I, I've seen in so many families, my own included, where, man, the firstborn just seems to have a bigger target on their back. And Satan seems to take down the firstborn um, in so many cases. And, and, and I'll tell you, I, I feel like he, he feels like if he can get a hold of him or her, th- then he can really do a lot of damage to the family. He can really derail your whole family. So I think Satan goes after our firstborn a lot. You think about the first of your harvest or your tithe. Satan tries to make tithing or giving 10% to the Lord, try, he'll, he'll try to make it seem like that is so, so impossible for us to accomplish. How in the world can anyone give 10% to the Lord and still survive in this world? Is that even really possible? And that's how he wants to get us to think. And many people think, well, I can, I can do it if I just had more money. But uh, let me just say, uh, here's what I believe. I believe God can do way more in your life with 90% than you can do with 100%. But Satan wants to make that seem so difficult and so impossible. But tithing has has nothing to do with how much money um, you have, but has everything to do with your understanding of the fact that God gave it all to you in the first place. And if he, if he owns it all anyway, and he says, I want you to give me a portion, I want you to give me of your first fruits, then, then we're really just doing what he wants with his money. And that's what we're called to do as stewards, is to say, okay, I'm managing what you're giving me, and you want this first fruit portion. Okay, well, I trust you enough to give that, just like in the harvest, just like when they, when they harvested crops. I'm, I trust you enough to give you of these first fruits. But if Satan could get you to hold back that tithe, I don't know if you saw when he was talking about those first fruits, he says, you know what, and your harvest will be plentiful. Your silos will be full. Your vats will be bursting. 
because God's honored when we give him the first of our harvest. But man, when we don't, when we say, well, I don't really trust you, God, so I'm going to hold on to your portion, and I'm going to try, because I need it, then all we're doing is we're ripping ourselves off from the blessing of God. Can we see that? So that's what Satan will try to do. The question is, are you willing to trust God enough to give him his portion of your finances? Think about your first love. Man, Satan tries to get you to give yourself, your heart, your passion to so many other things. Anything but God. Satan doesn't need to get you to love him. All he needs to do is get you to love something other than God first. Right? Then he's got you off track. He, he's, got you, he's got you separated from God. If he can just get anything between you and God, anything to become first in your life before God, he's won. He wants you to give away your first love, then he knows you're going to miss out. If you give away your first love to anything other than God, you're going to miss out on the fullness of God's blessing in your life and the fullness of what it means to really walk with God. Is there something in your life that, he's, that has stolen that first love from him? Think about the first part of life. Man, so much of, so much of our youth culture is under direct attack by the enemy. The, the music, the media, the entertainment, all the technology, our education system, all of it challenges their faith and tries to get them to doubt God. Doubt that there is a God or at least doubt that he cares about you. Satan knows if he can get a hold of kids in the first part of life, he can cause all kinds of grief and anger and depression and guilt and all kinds of other things that will keep them from experiencing God's blessing in their lives. The first part of your day. Come on, for, for most of us, it's tough to get up and to spend time with the Lord in the morning, right? Right? There's a few of you that are out there where you're like, no, I get up at, you know, 3.30 so I can spend three hours with the Lord before I go to work. Um, and, I, you know, great, you're awesome. <laughs> and keep it up. But the rest of us aren't like that. It's challenging. It's difficult to, to get up and spend time in the morning with the Lord, you know, because our mind starts thinking of all the things we got to do that day or we get up late or the kids need this and we got to, man, we got to get to work and we stayed up too late watching TV or, you know, just, our, our, just it gets difficult. It gets challenging. How important is the first part of your day to, though, to setting the tone for the rest of your day? Man, if you can get up and get your heart right with God and spend time with Him, it can change, really, your perspective. It can change your attitude. It can change everything in your day. That's why I think it's, it's, really, it's really important. And if you fail to give God the first part of your day, you increase the chances, I think. You increase your chances of missing out often on what God has for you that day. Sometimes we miss it because we just, we're, we're not thinking spiritually. We're not, our, our hearts and minds aren't really necessarily in tune with God because of all the other things. And, and so we can miss some of the things that he puts right in front of us that day because we fail to just take even just a little bit of time and say, okay, God, this is your day. What do you have for me today? And put our spiritual lenses on. Are you willing to do whatever is necessary to, to say, ah, I want to spend time with God, even if it's just for a few minutes with him in the morning before I do anything else, in his word or in prayer? Give him the first part of my day. First day of the week, man. Satan makes it tough to commit to, to being with the church. You know, you, did you know that people that were considered committed to the church used to, used to be show up three to four times a month? Do you know that that is boiled down to people that are considered committed to the church show up one and a half times a month? Sad. We just have so many other things vying for our attention. So many other distractions. So many other things now going on on Sunday mornings. You know, they don't have the Rose Parade this morning because they made a commitment back in the 1880s that they would never do it on a Sunday because they didn't want to disrupt the church services that, go, that, that were happening along Colorado Boulevard and scare the horses that would be tied up out in front of those churches for the people that are there to worship on Sunday morning. 
And so they said, we're never going to do it on Sunday. That's why the, it's tomorrow. It's not this morning. Because, man, meeting together for church used to be important in our culture. Meeting together as the church used to be something that was protected. It's not anymore. Now we've got, we've got so many things competing, you know, football and NASCAR and motocross and kids club sports. And, or, or it's like, well, it's the only time for us to spend as a family because of our work schedules. And, and all of these things where we say, well, yeah, we don't need to go. We don't need to be there. We don't need to be a part of it. But if you hold back giving God uh, that, that day of the week, that time of worship, I, I, believe, I believe you miss out on God's blessing that comes from giving him the first part of your week. And I'll tell you, Satan will do whatever he can to, to keep you from committing your Sundays to God and being here to worship with God's people. And, and you know if you've gotten away from it, man, the, the, you, you, miss, you miss a couple times, and then, then you miss a few more times, and then it just gets real easy. You know, at first, you're like, ah, we should go back. Then it gets real easy. Like, well, okay, I haven't been there in so long. And now if I go back, now people are going to go, well, where have you been? And, you know, so I better, you know, you, some of you know that you think that, huh? <laughs> and we might, but it's not because we didn't, don't want you here. It's because we do want you here. Will you commit to being here with God's people to, to, to worship and, and, and try to do away with as many conflicts as you can? Satan wants what God wants. And he'll do whatever he can to keep God from getting it. Here's the question. Will you continue to let the enemy have those victories in your life? Or will you say, no, I'm going to give God what God wants. I'm going to give God the first things in my life. So here we are on the, the first part of this first day in 2017. It's a great time. It's a great time to decide if you're going to give God what he wants this year. You're off to a really good start. <laughs> and I'm not talking about New Year's resolutions that fizzle out by the, you know, the middle of January. I'm talking about being resolute, like Scott said. I'm talking about making a commitment to the Lord. You know what, God? I want to do better at giving you the first things in my life. I want to do better this year at giving you what you want in my life. And so you take a look at these things and you say, yeah, you know what? There's some of those I, I need to do better at. I want to give God what he wants. What does God want? He wants the first things in your life. And I'll tell you something. If you want to experience God's blessings in your life in 2017, give God your first and your best. Because when you trust him with your first and with your best, he promises his blessing. I don't know what that will look like. I don't know what that means. But I know he's going to come through and he's going to bless you. Because he says so in his word. Let's pray. Lord, right now, we just want to take a minute and or just reflect on these things. And this principle you lay out in your, in your word, this principle of first fruits. And God, it's a principle you choose to use to, to bless your people. And Lord, we want to experience your blessings. We want more of whatever you have for us. In whatever way you choose to bless us, we want more of it. And God, I pray right now that 2017 would be a year full of your blessing in our lives, individually, in our families, and in this church. But Lord, that begins with us saying, God, we commit to you our first and our best. Because we've put our whole lives in your hands. 
We know it all belongs to you. And we want to manage it well, whether that be our time, our possessions, our talents, our finances, that be our decisions, our careers, our families, our relationships. We want to manage all of that in a way that honors you. And we know it honors you when we give you what you want, when we give you the first things. Our passions, our desires. So God, right now, on this first part of this first day of this new year, we just renew that commitment to you. And we followed through on that commitment in varying degrees of success this last year. But this new year, we want to do better. And there's changes we need to make. And there's commitments that we need to, to, to renew and to, to strike up on. And, and there's, there's things that we need to evaluate in order to do that. So we make that commitment right now, God. We lay it before you. And we look forward to your blessing in whatever way you choose to bring it. And Lord, if there's anyone in this room who's never committed their life and their heart to you, God, I pray right now you just let them know and they are missing out. They are really missing out. And I pray, God, that, that they would make that decision, that commitment right now. What a great day to commit their life and their heart to you for the very first time. To say, yes, I need Jesus in my life. I need forgiveness. I want a personal relationship with Almighty God. And God, I pray that would happen even right now. You're an awesome God, and we love you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.